I'm speaking with a uh, Grammy winner and Emmy nominated uh, Nan Schwartz, who is a veteran TV and film composer, as well as a prolific uh, orchestrator who is a frequent collaborator with uh, Alexandra Desplat. Uh, Nan most recently worked on Argo with Desplat, as well as Life of Pi with Michael Donna. Uh, thanks so much for speaking with, with me today. Well, it's my pleasure. So I guess to start, uh, and kind of looking back, uh, what was it that made you want to get into music, and what really pushed you towards the direction of uh, film and TV composing? Um, well, I grew up in a very musical family. My dad was a uh, studio musician, having been the original lead clarinet with Glenn Miller hmm. and cl creating the Glenn Miller sound. And he went on from there to uh, play on all the Frank Sinatra recordings and in the studios as a woodwind player uh, in TV, film, and records and everything. My mom was had a parallel career as a singer. She started out with Tommy Dorsey and uh, as a sentimentalist with several hits and then came out to L.A. and became a studio singer, worked on a number of variety shows and um, uh, movies and records and whatnot. So having grown up in that environment, I was surrounded with great music. Uh, however, I was quite intimidated by their success, and I thought that the only career options open to me at the time were playing the piano, which I had been studying for quite a while, or singing, which I had been a child singer since the age of about five. Having perfect pitch, I was able to go in and read music and on the spot, and that, so I was in demand as a singer. But when I got to be older and had to make those career choices, I just didn't have the drive to be a pianist in the studios, and I... Um, as a singer, I just uh, wasn't interested in pursuing that. One reason which was that when my mom was doing it, she got to sing live with the orchestra, and today's technology meant that you would just go in after the fact and put on a headphone and sing along with the track, and right. I didn't enjoy that. So I thought that there was no place for me in music. I um, went off to college, got a degree in TV production, started working up the ladder as a assistant director at, on various variety shows and and um, specials and things like that. And then I broke my leg at a very uh, important time in my life. I was 22, and I was laid up for nine months, having not uh, not being able to walk or anything. I was quite incapacitated. And so when I was laying there in bed, I started writing music just for the heck of it because I was bored, and I uh, didn't have to get to the piano because of my perfect pitch. And a family friend took me out to lunch when I was finally able to walk on crutches, and she said, why aren't you writing scripts? You have the time and connections. And and um, I said, well, I don't have any ideas. And she said, well, what's your big dream in life? And I said, well, I think I would have liked to be a film composer like Johnny Mandel, because when I was growing up, my dad came home from work one day and just said I had the best experience of my life, and he told us about playing on the soundtrack to The Sandpiper, wow. which uh, really established Johnny Mandel as a film composer. He it was he wrote the song The Shadow of Your Smile as the theme and and just um, used that as the basis of his score and it was so evocative and I played it incessantly. So I said to her that day I would have liked to be a film composer but I'm a woman. There were no women doing it and I said I already c finished college and it's just too late for me and she said well why don't you go study privately and why don't you be the first woman? So I got very fired up by her um, pep talk, and I went out and found a teacher and started studying orchestration and uh, started as an arranger and then had a chance to do some ghostwriting on different uh, TV movies and things like that and found that creativity involved, and that was quite challenging and fun. So I branched off into television. Wow, that's such an amazing story. It's really cool. <laughs> I hope I didn't give you too long of a version of it. Oh, no, not at all. Um, so now, I mean, now you're, you've are you been working in the industry, you know, a lot, and you're such a, you're kind of a go-to person for, for orchestrations, and um, can you describe what that job title entails as an orchestrator and what your responsibilities are? Well, in the case of Argo and Life of Pi, um, both of those um, movies uh, used ethnic influences. All right, uh, yeah. Michaels was Indian, obviously, and um, he approaches the uh, film scoring thing as a concert composer, which is his background, and so he has a unique artistic take on things. And he, he's sort of free to conventions of film music, 
so it was a challenge to try to um, integrate the orchestra into what he had conceived for that movie. Um, as in the case of Argo, the same thing, but in a different um, area. He was using Middle Eastern influences. Mm -hmm. And I had worked with Alexander on Syriana, and that was quite effective in using orchestra with that. In this case, uh, the ethnic orchestra uh, instruments dominated most of the score in Argo. And then near the end, the orchestra came in more predominantly once that the plane cleared the Iranian airspace. We wanted to use the orchestra to... Um, uh, make it more Americanized and indicating they were away from the Middle East. And so I think the challenge was to support the um, film with the orchestra without overwhelming the ethnic influences in both of those films. Right. And uh, when you do work with uh, something you know so, so specific like that with certain instruments and uh, sounds, um, do you have to do a lot of research for, for that type of world, you know, that area of the world's music, or are you, just from experience, are you kind of more well-versed in that, in, in kind of world sounds and world music? Well, I think that I've heard enough of it to know uh, what he's going for. Mm -hmm. um, I think the composer himself does the research, if there is research to be done in terms of uh, finding the right ethnic instruments. Then in, in the case of um, those films, it was the orchestration job to um, take what take those instruments and those choices of instruments and work the orchestra with it. Uh, okay. So I, I would say I, I didn't have to do research on that. I just had to make sure that I reinforced, stayed out of the way, but kept the colors that he had established. Mm -hmm. And you've worked with Alexander on, on many films, so I'm assuming the, the relation, working relationship is a, is a good one. Uh, what's it like working uh, with him? Oh, he's terrific. He's just so... Um, easygoing, and he, he's easygoing in spite of the pressure he's under. I mean, I've never seen such pressure as I saw him on Harry Potter. There was so much music to be written, and the producers were frankly quite demanding and asked for changes on the spot, and he was kept his cool, and he's got a French charm that just sort of supersedes everything and um, allows him to just sort of... Um, He's he's persuasive, you know. He gets mm -hmm. his way, ultimately, because he, but he makes them feel like they're winning. Right. And he's just a genuine nice person. But the the thing that I'm so amazed about with him is that I've done a number of, um, of films with him now, and his range is so extraordinary. I mean, we did Rise of the Guardians this year, which was animated, and that was a million notes and animated. And then we did Moonrise Kingdom, and that was based on uh, Benjamin Britten music. We did Benjamin Button, which was different completely, and then we did Julia and Julie and Julia, which was a French waltz kind of thing. And then here's Argo again, and uh, like I said, Syriana we had done before. That was Middle Eastern. Wow. So he knows how to cast it too. He gets the right people in there, and he for uh, Argo he brought people in from from the Middle East to perform on the score. And when you work with other different composers. Um... Do you really do you have to change kind of adapt your approach to how they work? Is it is it tough to kind of match a composer's work work ethic or workflow, or is it more kind of the same to same from from project to project? Well, every project is different mm -hmm. in terms of you know the music you're given, but I would say that we try to we orchestrators just try to keep up with the <laughs> the composers as they're writing. Mm -hmm. We're trying to orchestrate as we go, so we don't get too backed up at the end. And so now, I mean, you're not just an orchestrator, you're also such a, a, a wonderful composer. And um, so when you're in the composing seat as a musical storyteller, what elements of, of a film or a, really sparks your creativity the most? Is it the characters, the setting, the plot, uh, you know, creative elements like editing or cinematography? What really kind of uh, gets your writing going when you first approach a project? All of the above, <laughs> <laughs> I would say. You know, I heard someone say, I think it's John Williams said, that he doesn't even bother reading the script. Well, he yeah. only starts reacting when he sees the film. And I think that's probably um, a good policy because you are reacting to all those things and the tone that is set by the filmmaker. And even though there, the words are on the page in the script, it's not really a completed form until um, you see it on screen. Not to mention the fact that they often put temp music in there, which right. people do 
one way or the other, and at least in terms of what they wanted. And then yeah. you try to bring your own sensibility to it and keep and figure out first, oh, what is it about that temp score that they like? Do you, find, do you find the temp music, most composers I talk to find it very uh, inhibiting and, and intrusive. Do you, do you, have you kind of made peace with temp music, or do you still like kind of groan when, when they present it to you? <laughs> I would say that there's so few projects I've ever been on that haven't had a temp score. Well, in television, in, in television, they don't have a time for, for uh-huh. a temp score. And um, fortunately, I've been involved in several TV series where they didn't know what they wanted, and I was able to establish a style from the first part. And um, like In the Heat of the Night, which I did for its full run of 10 years or more. Right, right. And, right. and it was obviously um, influenced by the setting in the South. And the, the uh, so it, it called for guitars and kind of a um, country slash blues slash. But then I brought my own harmonies into it that were more than the typical triads that you would hear. Um, but anyway, back to your question about the temp score, I would say that uh, I'm used to it. I, it just seems sort of a given now nowadays. I can't remember a time when there wasn't temp scoring. Well, yeah, that's it's, it's kind of sad because I know I've, I've heard even very, you know, composers who are definitely auteurs and you hear it and you can just, you can sense that it's they're trying to mimic or cover something that, that I've heard before. <laughs> Yeah, that's the trick. I mean, temp scores would be great if they were just sort of a guideline and said, hey, you know, follow this sort of. Mm -hmm. Then it sort of helps you get going. It does help you get started. But if they're so in love with it that really that's what they wanted to begin with and they couldn't hire that composer because he was too expensive or he was busy, then you sort of feel like you're always, you know, the second, second one asked to the dance, you know. Right, yeah. Well, uh, I guess to wrap up, I always like to ask composers uh, this one question. If you could score any film ever made with uh, no disrespect to the original composer, which film would you choose? Well, I have one in mind right now. It hasn't been scored yet, but I would love to write the score for Fifty Shades of Grey. Oh, that's right, because they're working on the film. And I did read that you you worked on a, on a kind of a demo for it, right? Yes, I I got inspired when I when I. Uh, read the book and I thought and I heard they were making a movie and I thought I would be the perfect person for this because I definitely think that I'm the target audience uh, <laughs> women um, and I there's so few women composers out there that I, I definitely think they have to choose from the pool that we live in right. and I feel that my music is the most um, sensual and evocative of that uh, seems to be what that kind of a movie would call for as opposed to some sort of cheesy you know porn Emmanuel <laughs> treatment it needs to be classed up a little bit otherwise it really could you know be a big flop yeah yeah so like so when you read the book and you like we were just talking about how you won't even read the script and you'd rather wait for the picture what what inspired you to really write the music when you were reading the book what what about it that got you, got your ideas going well like i said i thought it needed to be sensual mm-hmm. without being tawdry and it needed to be classy and it needed to be um beautiful mm-hmm. and uh not not tacky or tasteless and so i had some tracks that i uh have written from other uh, assignments that I thought worked beautifully. A lot of strings, a lot of um, just nice textures, right, things right. like that. And well, so I put that demo together. Well, uh, hopefully that comes your way. That would be something I'd be very interested to, to, to hear your take on it. And uh, I really appreciate the time today, and uh, congratulations on everything, and I mean, good luck at the, you know, with you and your team and, and Alexandra and Michael at the Oscars uh, coming up, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm very excited. I'm sure one of, uh, either one of them is going to be taking one home, so I think you're you're good either way. <laughs> well, it's just an honor to be part of both of those projects. Mm-hmm. And uh, hopefully we get to do this again sometime. All right. Thank you so much.